we're going to do a, a series of questions. And I, I want to, to start by doing some kind of straightforward ones, and then they're going to get uh, at a level of complication every time. Does that make sense? We are doing Newton's second law for torque. But these problems are also going to be about force, clearly. So when we talk about Newton's second law for torque, I have to and, you know, be, be clear that we are evaluating the forces as they act on an object and determining whether an object accelerates, has an angular acceleration, or both. It's quite possible that you can have more than one or none of these things, depending on the situation. We've already talked about static problems and some of the features of doing a static problem. And we've definitely done our share of force problems and how you're supposed to organize yourself. I'm adding to it. I'm not going back through it. So if you have your old force notes, you should be referring to them. They all started out the same way with choose whether it's a first law problem or a second law problem. And then start making some identifying pieces of information from there. With torque, you had to start adding things like the pivot point and the calculation of the individual torques. That's going to be more pronounced now that we also have moment of inertia to deal with. So I want to start with a a relatively simple meter stick problem because it highlights a bunch of things about the way these problems are going to be structured. If you just drop a meter stick through the air, it's probably going to be experiencing two forces. Weight downwards and probably a drag force upwards seems appropriate, wouldn't you say? If we're just dealing with forces, they won't be zero because if you just drop a meter stick, it's going to fall. So I, I want to say right away that if all things being similar, if you carefully drop a meter stick, as I'm indicating here, there might not be an unbalanced torque, even though there is an unbalanced force. Right? We know that the Gravitational force is said to act at the center of mass of the object, but the truth is it acts all along the object, pulling on every piece of mass. It's just that it's balanced. Now, the drag force may or may not act at the center of mass. It may act in a more non-uniform way, depending on how the meter stick catches the air. So whether or not there is a rotation really depends on where the force of drag acts under this circumstance. So if the force of drag were non-uniform and there was more of it to one side than the other, then I think we'd have this object both fall and accelerate rotationally at the same time. But I want you to, to be aware from the very beginning that these are separate things. You can have net force equals zero and not have net torque equals zero. But you could have net torque equals zero and not have net force equals zero. We have to evaluate them separately. That is our start. And so to kind of point out what we do with that information, when we approach forces, we approach them like we did from the beginning. The forces acting on an object act as if the object were a point mass. So we still treat the translational part the way we did before. The center of mass of the meter stick is what we focus on for the translational part. But then the torque portion takes into account where those forces are acting. It will determine any angular acceleration the object will experience. And so when we start evaluating the torque portion of the problem, you need to stop and ask, where is the pivot point in the problem? For static problems, you can choose any place to be the pivot point. If it's not a static problem, you need to be a little more careful now. So in your notes, let's add to it, choosing the pivot point. For static problems, you put it anywhere. Put it someplace convenient. For dynamics problems, there's either going to be a chosen pivot point given to you, or if the object is free to rotate, all objects rotate about their center of mass. I'll say it again. 
If the object is free to rotate, all objects will naturally rotate about their center of mass. But just be aware, an object can be rotating in more than one direction at once. So rotation is more complicated than translational motion. In the same way that an object can be moving in the x and y direction at the same time, it can be, something can be spinning along the z and x direction at the same time. So let's do a, a problem that might be a little bit easier. I'm going to take and connect the ends of the meter stick by strings to the ceiling and just hang the meter stick. Right now we're looking at a very static arrangement where the net force on the meter stick is zero and the net torque on the meter stick is zero. At t equals zero, I cut the right string. Okay. At t equals zero, I cut the right string. Now, I'm going to say a phrase that's going to be hard to hear. At that instant, the instantaneous velocity of the object is zero. Hear what I just said? It's important that we start getting used to this vocabulary. The instant I cut the string at t equals zero, the angular speed of the meter stick is also zero. The object is instantaneously at rest. Will it stay at rest? No. But during this moment at t equals zero, I would like to find out what the angular acceleration is. I'd like to find out what the net torque is. These are two things I'd like to know about the meter stick, that moment when it is instantaneously at rest. Now, again, I'll ask you, is it gonna stay at rest? That's how you know it's going to accelerate. It has to. There's unbalanced forces acting on it or unbalanced torques acting on it. Now, in this problem, is it clear to you where the pivot point should be placed? Yep. Sure, this has a fixed and identifiable pivot point that is given to us in the problem. It's not free to rotate about its center of mass. It's gonna rotate about this point. Now there are two forces acting on the meter stick. I don't think that they are equal, but there are two forces acting on the meter stick. There's the weight acting on the meter stick, but there's also tension acting on the meter stick. Since I'm interested in the angular properties of the meter stick, I'm going to focus on the torques. Now, I, I need to point out, I need to have you think about the reason I'm focusing on this instantaneous moment. Will the torque acting on the meter stick stay constant as the meter stick moves? Will the force acting on the meter stick stay constant? That's this one, right? Is that going to stay the same as the meter stick moves? Yeah. Is the torque arm length going to stay the same as the meter stick moves? Yes. Will the angle stay the same as the meter stick moves? No. So the torque is going to change. So although we can find the acceleration at time equals zero, it's not going to stay the same, you know, at all once it begins to move. It's gonna change. Is it gonna get bigger, smaller? Well, we already covered it's not gonna stay the same. So is it gonna get bigger or smaller, the torque? How do we calculate torque? What's that? R times, times, thank you. Right now, what is the sine of, what is the theta, or phi in this case? What angle does it make? 90 degrees. I'll remind you, 90 degrees is the most effective angle for a torque. Any other angle will be less effective. The torque's going to get smaller as it moves. Has to, right? It's already at 90 degrees. Any other angle will be less. So when we 
These aren't trick questions. You need to have a means of finding an answer. I'm giving you the, that means, as I hope I am. All right, let's move on to actually doing this. We have identified the pivot point. We now need to identify the torques that are acting on the object. We have one. You did a lab, so help me out here. What is the mass of a meter stick? What did you find it to be? What's that? All right, we're going to go with 80 grams then. There was a lot of people in sixth period who couldn't tell me the mass of a meter stick. Since it was part of your lab, I'm a little bit concerned. If you can't tell me the mass of a meter stick, I don't know what you did, but there's a scale over there. You could have checked. I would have if my lab asked what is the mass of a meter stick. I'd make sure that my method produced something that was, was similar to what the scale tells me. All right. Um, you should be able to calculate this torque for me without needing me to help you very much. We have the mass of the meter stick, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of the size of a meter stick. So I'll give you about, I don't know, 30 seconds, and then I'm going to call on one of you. Uh, where along the length of the meter stick? We need the torque arm length. R represents the distance from the pivot point to where the force is acting. I'd say around the center. Around the center. How far away is that from the end? It's, about it's a meter stick. 50. 50. All right, so <coughs> 0 0.5 meters. All right. Um, the force would be the weight of the meter stick. So uh, mg, so 0 0.08 kilograms. Got to put everything in terms of kilograms, meters, and seconds. And I'll multiply by 10. Still good? All right. And then um, sine of 90 degrees. That all seem all right for you guys? All right, so this is the torque from the weight of the meter stick. And I'm thinking we're looking at 0.4 kilograms, I'm um, oh, sorry, meter newtons. That is the answer to the question, what is the unbalanced torque acting on the meter stick? To calculate the unbalanced torque or the net torque, if you're asked for net torque or net force, you have either to add up all the forces or torques, or you would need the mass and acceleration or in the case of rotational, the inertia and the acceleration. Either way, there's two different ways to calculate net torque. We had a method that allowed us to calculate the individual torques. That's what we did. So now you need to go one step further, I think. Uh, I want the acceleration. You know what the net torque is. You'll have to find the moment of inertia. So take a moment and find the moment of inertia. I'll pick on somebody for that too. When we did force, we never had to stop and have an extra step to figure out moment of inertia. Doing torque requires that we have an extra step. And we're always going to have to ensure that we're making, being careful about how we deal with moment of inertia. Uh, finding the acceleration is just net torque divided by moment of inertia. And you get 15, but the units are important here. Torque is meter newton, moment of inertia, kilogram meter squared. Newton is kilogram meters per second squared. So the kilograms cancel and all the meters cancel, and you're left with nothing per second squared. What does that mean? Radians, that's right. Now, I, I don't know if 15 is a lot. I really don't. So 10 meters per second squared is a lot of acceleration. 15 radians per second squared, it's hard to know. I, I know that if you have a meter stick, it's whatever it was when I first let it go, right? But did it stay 15 radians per second squared for very long? No, and you guys, it's hard to see acceleration. You're seeing velocity for sure, but it's hard to see acceleration. Now, 
this was a relatively straightforward question. I think it gave us the pieces that we need to move on to a more complicated question. So I'd, li I'd like to move on to a more complicated question. We won't have time to finish it, but we'll have time to get it started. We started with this one, which was me trying to remind you and talk to you about unbalanced torques and instantaneous acceleration. And that in certain situations, the acceleration is not constant because the torque isn't constant. All right, so I have a pulley that is connected by an axis through its center to a bracket to hold it in place. I have a mass that is going to be hung off the side of the pulley using a light string. like so. The pulley has a radius of say 25 centimeters and a mass of two kilograms. So this is like a, almost like one of those five pound weights from the gym. We're gonna hang a one kilogram box off of it. We'll assume that there's no friction in the axle of the pulley. If I release the system, how many of you think the green box is going to accelerate? All right, so as a group, we think the net force on the box will be equal to MA. All right, how about the pulley? If I release the box, will the pulley accelerate and be careful um, will the net force on the pulley be equal to ma is the pulley going to change location so the net force on the pulley is zero is the pulley going to have a rotational acceleration so the net torque on the pulley is not zero. Again, I want to be very clear that you can have something have a net force of zero, but that's not a net torque of zero. We need to be aware that we need to evaluate torque and force for objects that are going to spin and potentially change location. I think the pulley is going to stay where it is. It's just going to accelerate. It's going to spin out. With that start, um, this is an Atwood machine problem. And like any connected Atwood machine problem, there's probably going to be some forces that the objects have in common and some motion that connects the objects together. The first thing I would think about doing is recognizing a common direction for positive. I think that's a common direction for positive. With that being said, I think we can deal with the forces acting on the box first. How many forces do you think are acting on the box? I think two is reasonable. Name one. What's that? Sure, tension. Upwards. What else? Downwards. Would you draw the weight greater than the tension? Yeah, I think that's probably appropriate. In fact, based on what we have written here, I'm thinking mg minus tension equals MA. Based on what we've been given, we know M and G. That leaves us with two unknowns, tension and acceleration. So we can't solve the problem for acceleration here. What forces do you think are acting on the pulley? What's that? All right, tension. Anything else? What's that? 
Um, I indicated there was no friction in the bearing. So I don't think there's a frictional torque acting. No. Yep. All right. Normal works for me. Anything else? I think there's one more that you're missing, the one that you're supposed to evaluate first. Doesn't the, doesn't the pulley have mass? So therefore it has weight. Now, net force equals zero. So tension plus weight minus normal equals zero. I'm being consistent with direction. Does net torque equal zero? No. All right, that's it. There. So when we look at the box that's hanging, we have the mass and we know what G is, two unknowns. When we look at the pulley, Bless you. We have uh, both of these, but that's it. You know, so normal and tension. We've introduced another, another unknown, so we're up to three unknowns and two equations. So if we're trying to figure out the tension in the string, or if we're trying to figure out the acceleration of the system, then we're likely going to have to look at the net torque on the pulley because the pulley is going to have its own inertia. It's going to attempt to not be moved and so we need to see how the tension acting in this cable is affected by the inertia of the pulley. So our next job is to come up with a net torque equation for the pulley. Now to do that, remember torque is the product of three things. There's only one torque acting on the pulley, so I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time listing all the torques because in the other ones we've had lots of torques acting, there's just one. But I will recognize that since it is a pulley, this is always gonna be sine 90 degrees. No matter how you try to take that string off of a pulley, it's always gonna come off the pulley tangent to the pulley, making this always 90 degrees. It'll either wrap around or unwrap some, so that's always leaving the pulley perpendicular to the pulley. And that's one of the things about using a pulley. If the pulley's a circle, if the pulley is oblong or an oval, that won't be true. Or at least the torque can't be counted on to do that. But as long as it's a circle, it'll always be perpendicular. So in writing out the net torque, we know that the value for R is just gonna be the radius of the pulley. Right? That's a torque arm length, but the torque arm length is just the distance from the axis of rotation to where my t tension is applied. That'll be a radius. The force, in this case, is the tension. And this has to be equal, moment of inertia. We're dealing with a pulley. So I look at my chart, find the moment of inertia of a pulley. Well, I'm sorry, moment of inertia of a disc. <coughs> Thanks. Then multiply by alpha. Now, this gets us closer, but I know the radius. I know the radius and the mass. I've just introduced another variable. So I have three equations now and four unknowns, all right? Because I have alpha now, I don't have A. This is where in these problems, you should stop and ask yourself, can I use this relationship in order to exchange acceleration for alpha? I ask you not to take this decision particularly lightly. I would encourage you to, to consider when this would be true and when this isn't true. First, if the string doesn't slip, then the wheel turning this distance is probably gonna cause the box to move an equivalent distance, right? If the wheel turns around once, the box moves one circumference. But I also want you to be aware that, so from here, uh, I think this is a case where we can use this, which brings us to our last step. We have one, two, three relationships, plus this one now. If we're trying to figure out the acceleration, 
then we're probably going to be trying to do some elimination here. When we did this first semester, we generally tried to eliminate the tension and find the acceleration first. It was usually easier that way. But we have to make an, an, a, 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 another substitution that we didn't have to do before. We have to decide whether we're going to work the problem in terms of the angular acceleration or work the problem in terms of the linear acceleration. It doesn't really matter. That's your choice. I would encourage you to use the linear acceleration. And, and the reason why, it's my opinion, but the reason why is most of the time, if you substitute in and replace the angular with the linear, the radius of your object will cancel out. So I would strongly encourage you to always try putting the whole thing in terms of the linear acceleration and not the angular acceleration. Let's try it here. Solved it for alpha, plugged in A over R. The very first thing I see is all the R's cancel. See that okay? All you mathletes out there. Now, this point forward, it looks a lot like one of those simple Atwood machine problems we did first semester. I can stack the equation. I'm going to have one thing with a positive t and one thing with a negative t. Add those together. T is eliminated because it's an internal force. Factor out the acceleration. And we get the same kinds of things we got first semester. The unbalanced force in the system, which was the weight of the box, equals the inertia of the system. Here's how the two things interact to provide the inertia of the system times the acceleration. Once you have the acceleration, you can go back and figure out any other piece that you need. Now, I'm not going to put the numbers in. I'll let you put numbers in. But I would like to look at if we did a standard basic pulley question to give you an example of how you have to step through the problem and apply net torque and net force to the problem. A, uh, a more complicated example. One that I think exemplifies all the pieces. Because we started, this one is a further reminder of how we have to deal with some things that we didn't have to deal with first semester. Imagine the same size pulley. So same radius, same mass, all that. I'm going to connect a block to it over here and a block on the table. The table, so let's give it some table legs. And let's have a ground. All right. Same one kilogram block, pulley two kilograms is a disc. Radius 0.25 meters, just like before. I'll say it's a three kilogram block here. Okay. Um, a modified Atwood machine problem. If you think back to first semester, you should probably be able to figure out what the answer this would be if I asked for like the acceleration without having to do much work. The net force is M1G. Inertia of the system would have been M3 plus 
M1 times A. Right, that's what we would have gotten first semester if the pulley didn't have inertia. Do you remember this problem from first semester? The issue is that the pulley has inertia. Its inertia is going to show up somewhere in this problem, probably in here. One big difference between a massless pulley and a pulley that has inertia is that it takes an unbalanced torque to get a pulley to rotate, to get it to accelerate. Last semester, we said the tension in the string here was equal to the tension in the string there. That was because our pulleys were massless. If the pulley has mass, that won't be true. There's going to be an unbalanced torque, which requires that this tension be different than this tension. In fact, it should be pretty clear to you that this will be a greater tension than this because the system's going to go that way. So let's start by identifying what we think are probably the forces acting in our system. I'm going to start by saying that there's a tension here. I'm going to call it T1 and a tension here. I'm going to call it T2. I think the box is experiencing T1. And for this example, let's just assume that there is no friction, just so we can focus on the important distinctions between this problem and first semester problems. I think, of course, this box is experiencing T2 upwards, but M1G downwards. The pulley is also experiencing two other forces. It's experiencing a force of gravity downwards, but it's also experiencing probably a normal force this way. Those two forces act at the center of the pulley, which is where the pivot point is. So they don't provide a torque, but they're still acting on the pulley and you should still be aware that you could be asked to find them out. B cognizant that although there are four forces acting on the pulley it's still true that the pulley's net force is going to equal zero does the pulley change location in this problem no so when it comes to the pulley's net force i expect it to stay right there so i'm going to focus on the torques on the pulley and the forces that are on the masses actually i said that wrong you're going to focus on it because I'm going to give you 60 seconds to come up with the three Newton's Law equations that bring these three things together. All right, good job. M1G minus T2 equals M2A. Got some low-hanging fruit there. Good one. Not quite the lowest of the hanging fruit, but it'll do. Who can give me another one? Go ahead. T1 equals M3A. Excellent. All right, so somebody has to hit this one now. Go ahead. Is there 1 over 2 MR squared plus T1 equals T2? 1 over 2 MR squared alpha equals what? Uh, T2. Obviously, I did. Okay, so R T2 minus R T1. For it to be a torque, it has to be the size of the torque arm times the force. That's it. I have one torque equation and two force equations. Any questions about that? Can we apply in this circumstance A equals alpha times R? Yeah, I think we can. So I would encourage you to apply it here. So we'll get RT2 minus RT1 equals one half MR squared A over R. All the R's cancel. So T2 minus T1 equals one half M A 
If I pull all these threads together, do you see that I have a positive T2 and a negative T2, a positive T1 and a negative T1. I could just add these together. And if, if you're careful, M1G equals one half M plus, I guess that's M1, not M2. So M1A plus M3A. Factor out the A's. Not terrible. All right, we've done the basic problems. We've done a single pulley problem. We've done a modified Atwood machine problem. We've done a simple instantaneous torque slash acceleration question. These are some basics. Um, there's some hard ones in the homework. Not terribly so, but ones that might make you think. But we've done some of the basics. There are certainly scenarios where that might not work the same way. Bless you. What if we have a, a pulley that's more like a sprocket, like this? Right? Do you see how this would kind of change that formula a little bit? The sprocket itself is co-angular, so all of the sprocket would turn with the same acceleration, same velocity. But with the radius here being different than the radius here, these two boxes would not have the same acceleration. This would be, say, the inner radius, and this is the outer radius. So the acceleration of the blue box would be whatever the angular acceleration is times the inner radius, and the acceleration of the green box would be whatever that angular acceleration is times the outer radius. So this is a condition in which we wouldn't have a straight relationship that is true for all of the objects in our system. Another example where this might not work, or at least might not work the way you think it would, would be if we, say, had a string that wrapped around the outside of the object like this. Maybe not like that. Help me out. Help me out, program. Be better. There we go. So what if I had a string that went around the outside of the object, connected to the ceiling, and then I was pulling up on the string here. You remember those pulley systems? In this example, if I pull this up one meter, how far does the center of mass move? Remember this from earlier in the year? I'm glad we pay such good attention. If I pull one meter of string up, I actually retract half a meter from this side and half a meter from this side. So the box only, or the pulley only moves up half a meter. This is a standard pulley system with, I get half the force, but that also reduces the distance I'm moving the object. I have to move one meter for the object to move just half a meter. Well, you can probably imagine that when we start considering the rotation of this system, how far did a disc rotate compared to what the acceleration of the disc was? So when we start asking this question, don't take it lightly. Be thoughtful about it. Most of the time, you'll be able to use this, but not every time. 